In this video, we're going to talk about how to graph basic functions. I hope you're excited for Calculus 2. What you'll find in this class is that some of the topics are directly related to graphs of basic functions that you learned in pre-calculus. In Calculus 2, we're going to be graphing a function and then looking at the area between the function and the x-axis, and then we're going to figure out what that area is. Okay, that's just one of the concepts that we see in Calculus 2. There are many others. We have to have our basic graphs at our fingertips. If I ask you on the spot to graph e to the x, I expect that you'll be able to graph e to the x. Polynomial function, logarithm function, sine, cosine, tangent as well. Let's first remember how to graph monomials. Mono means one, so monomials are just like polynomials, except they only have one term. You should know what the graph of x squared looks like coming into this course. We also have x to the fourth, x cubed, and x to the fifth. As you can see, there are some small details about this graph that I do hope you remember from pre-calculus. If I square or raise to the fourth power any number, it will always be positive. On the other hand, if I raise a negative number to an odd power, it will be negative. So the graph of x cubed and x to the fifth, they go through one comma one, but also negative one comma negative one, since negative one cubed is negative one, and negative one to the fifth is negative one. There are some additional features to the graph, such as x to the fourth is is actually smaller than x squared as long as the x value is less than 1. And if the x value is greater than 1, then x to the fourth is bigger than x squared. You can see a similar feature down here for x to the fifth is a bit smaller than x cubed if the x value is less than 1. The biggest concern for calculus 2 is to know what happens as x goes to infinity. Consider the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared. What it's really asking is what does the height of the x squared function do as the x values go to infinity. You can see that the height of the function goes to infinity, so here the answer is infinity. The limit as x goes to negative infinity on the x to the fourth graph. So as the x values go to negative infinity, where do the y values go on the x to the fourth graph? Here you can see in the blue graph that the answer is positive infinity. This is a bit different than if we take the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x cubed. Checking out the graph over here, if x goes to negative infinity, the height of the x cubed function goes down to negative infinity. As you can see, most limits rely on us knowing the basics about graphing, but we don't have to graph everything. Let's consider the limit as x goes to infinity of negative 8x to the 10. Now we know that 10 is an even power, so if the x value is going to infinity and it's raised to an even power, the x to the 10 part will also go to positive infinity. Now that positive infinity is multiplied times negative negative 8, so the final answer is negative infinity. Next, let's review the graphs of e to the x and ln of x. You might remember that these are inverses of each other, and there's a cute little graphical feature for graphs that are inverses. Draw the y equals x line, e to the x and ln of x are actually mirror images of each other. If they don't look quite like mirror images, that's because I'm not that great of an artist. But I don't expect you to be a great artist in this class either. You just have to remember the general features of the graph. As x goes to infinity, both the ln graph and the exponential graph go to infinity. If x goes to negative infinity on e to the x, let's take a look. As x goes to negative infinity, the height of the graph on the exponential function goes toward zero. How about the limit as x approaches zero of the ln function? You might remember that on the ln graph, it doesn't make any sense for the x values to approach zero except for from the right because the ln function is is not defined for any x value that is negative. So our x values here have to be positive as they approach zero. As the x values approach zero from the right, the height of the ln function shoots down to negative infinity. How about the limit as x approaches one of the ln graph? As the x values get closer and closer to x equals one, doesn't matter which direction we approach from, so I will not say plus or minus for left or right. It turns out that both of them are equal to zero. You might remember from calculus one, because the ln graph is continuous at x equals one, there's no jumps, no asymptotes right here on the graph. It is valid only in that special case when the function is continuous to say that if x approaches one, that's the same thing as just plugging in x equals one. And then you have to remember that ln of one is equal to zero. Let's look at one more. The limit as x approaches zero of e to the x. If our 
x values get closer and closer to zero, what does the height of the exponential function do? You got it, it approaches one because e to the zero power is equal to one. The exponential function is continuous at x equals zero, but taking the limit is the same as just plugging in zero. These two limits down in the corner here were examples where the function is continuous. ln is continuous at x equals one, e is continuous at x equals zero, but notice that none of these other limits were continuous. You cannot just plug in the value. It has to be continuous. So check out the ln function. As the x values approach zero, there's an asymptote here. The ln function is not continuous at zero. So here it is not valid to just plug in x equals zero. But we could do it for the exponential function because the exponential is continuous at x equals zero. I hope that these little details are sounding familiar to you. You do need to know how to do appropriate limits in this class. Try to take some limits of functions that we didn't do in the video on your own and look in the book to find additional examples. Next, let's review the graphs of sine and cosine. I hope you remember these are oscillatory functions from a height of minus one to a height of positive one. The sine function starts at zero and increases immediately and then oscillates from then on. The cosine function starts at one, begins to decrease, and then continues to oscillate. So for example, if we took the limit as x goes to zero of sine, remember the strategy from the previous slide. If the sine function is continuous at x equals zero, the limit can be done by just simply plugging in x equals zero. This is only valid because sine is indeed continuous at x equals zero. So now we have to remember our basics that sine of zero is equal to zero. The limit as x goes to infinity of the cosine function. If the x values approach infinity, what does the height of the cosine graph approach as x goes to infinity? It does not approach anything. It continues to oscillate infinitely. It does not exist. A few additional facts that we're going to be needing are important values of sine and cosine. For example, cosine of pi over 2. If I look at the cosine graph, one full oscillation is 2 pi. So the half of an oscillation is pi, and a half of that is pi over 2. So as you can see, I've got my answer now. So cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. You could get that from the unit circle as well. Let's try another one, cosine of pi. Check out this graph. We can see that the cosine graph is equal to negative 1 at pi. There are some additional values for sine and cosine that you should remember from your trigonometry class. You can get those from the triangle. 45, 45 right has two 45 degrees, two pi over four degrees, and a right angle, and a 30, 60, 90 triangle. 30, remember, is pi over six. 60, remember, is pi over three. How to draw this triangle, I always remember that the small angle is across from the small side and the big angle is across from the big side. Now for the sides of the triangle. On the 45, 45 right triangle, the sides are 1, 1, and square root of 2. Using the Pythagorean theorem, you can double check that 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to square root of 2 squared. In other words, 2 is equal to 2. For the sides of the triangle on the 30, 60, 90, we've got 1, square root of 3, and 2. Again, you can check that with the Pythagorean theorem. 1 squared plus square root of 3 squared is equal to 4, and of course that's equal to 2 squared. Using these triangles, we can get all sorts of values. Sine of pi over 4. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so if we look at the pi over 4 angle and get opposite divided by hypotenuse, we get 1 over square root of 2. Let's do cosine of pi over 6. Pi over 6 is here. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so we're getting square root of 3 over 2. And one more, let's do the tangent of pi over 3. The tangent is opposite over adjacent. So at pi over 3, the opposite is square root of 3 and the adjacent is 1. So the answer here is square root of 3 over 1. Remember that dividing by 1 just gives you back the same number, so we don't have to write divided by 1. Make sure you review all of the trig values that you can get from these two triangles. If you prefer to have, say, the unit circle memorized, that is perfectly fine as well. I reserve the to ask you at any moment during class, during exams, during quizzes. You should know these values for all of the trig functions, not only sine, cosine, and tangent, but also cosecant and secant and cotangent. There are two more graphs I want you to remember from trigonometry, the tangent graph and the arctangent graph. These are inverses of each other. Remember that inverse functions are mirror images of each other. If I take the tangent graph and I flip it over the y equals x line, I get the arctangent.
tangent graph. Now the tangent graph has asymptotes at x equals pi over 2 and x equals negative pi over 2. Do you remember why those asymptotes happen? It's because the tangent function is equal to sine over cosine. So anywhere that the cosine function is equal to 0, that makes the denominator on the tangent function equal to 0. You can't divide by 0. So that makes an asymptote on the graph of tangent. You may remember that the tangent graph keeps repeating. There's another leg of the tangent graph over here, and there's another asymptote over at x equals 3 pi over 2, again, where the cosine function is equal to 0. Now, in order to graph the arc tangent function, we just focus on this center piece, and we flip it over the y equals x line in order to get the arc tangent graph. But the asymptote flips, and now it becomes a horizontal asymptote. So this occurs at y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2. The limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the left on the tangent graph. So here, what does the height of the tangent graph do as the x values approach pi over 2 from the left? You can see that the height of the function goes up to positive infinity. If we had approached from the right, the answer would have been negative infinity. Let's do one more limit before we go. The limit as x goes to infinity of the arc tangent. Checking out the graph of arc tangent, the question is what does the height of the function do as the x values approach infinity? There's this asymptote that we talked about. The height of the function approaches, you guessed it, pi over 2. So there you go. There's a brief introduction to things I expect you to know from pre-calculus. There's a lot more, but I can't reteach you all of pre-calculus in a single video. So I hope that you'll challenge yourself and go look for more problems in the book. Check out the homework online and we'll see you in class soon.